Thank you for joining us for the annual video series from the International Symposium on Human Identification. We have a special guest today with us. Uh, Michael, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Sure, thanks for having me. Thank uh, my name is Michael Vogan. I'm the Director of Case Management at Authram Incorporated. Um, we work with law enforcement professionals, medical examiners, coroners to uh, generate identification from forensic evidence using uh, a lot of tools, um, target testing, genealogy, but ultimately we're digitizing profiles of forensic evidence. Um, I started in the medical space and kind of transitioned as, as a lot of folks do sometimes in, in forensics. I was in uh, the diagnostic side of DNA testing where, is where that's where I met David Middleman, our CEO. Uh, it was about eight years ago and uh, we kept in touch um, and then we decided to build a forensic lab from the ground up in 2018, late 2018. And uh, we chose to do that because we found that there was this huge opportunity um, to look at evidence from forensic scenes with a truly forensic approach end to end. And uh, in doing so, we, we've had a lot of success at going back and reevaluating old cases and being able to access information from that evidence to move those cases forward. Fantastic. Well, I know I've heard a lot about Authram, and some of our viewers might actually recognize you from the Missing Piece series that we've been working on for a bit now. Can you tell them a little bit about that? Absolutely. So the Missing Piece is a, is a great uh, video series that we've done with, uh, with Ishii and the backing of Ishii. Uh, it's kind of featuring a number of cases that, that Authram has been a part of from a lab perspective. And um, we work with so many great investigators across the country. Uh, who are very passionate about the work they do and about the cases that they're able to move forward and the families they're able to, to help affect in a positive way. Um, so we chose to put the series together that highlights some of these cases. And the cool thing about the missing piece is all these cases have, you know, different areas that people are focused on, different agencies involved. You have law enforcement doing their thing. You have the tech and lab people doing their thing. Um, and then you have the general public, too, that's helping these cases and move things forward. And then, of course, the families that are affected by this. So we thought it would be a really cool way to tell a story, uh, not a story, a factual uh, representation of real-life cases and show everyone's different uh, involvement and angle and how this collaboration between these four areas can come together to, to make uh, cases you know, come to a full circle and, and to a solve. I love it because I think forensic DNA, the theme we see again and again is collaboration. That's how you get to where you need to go. Absolutely. So um, that might answer the question, but why were you interested in partnering on it and how does it contribute to the work you're doing? Sure. Yeah. Well, well, Ishii's been great. Um, we do a lot of work with, with Ishii on a, a variety of fronts. Um, I know David works on a bunch of articles and I'm starting to co-write some of those with him as we get more in depth into this casework. Um, but I think it was just, you know, knowing that, uh, you know, Ishii has such a good um, uh, reach out into the forensic world and to folks that are working on human identification, um, we thought it was a cool opportunity to tell these stories and particularly when we got to know some of the investigators too. And, and we could tell that when, when they were able to move some of these cases forward that, that we assisted them with, you saw like a light bulb go off where they realized, oh my gosh, I have 10, 12 other cases that I need to go back and look at now because I was told there wasn't enough DNA, it was too degraded, and they were told this even within the last six months before we got involved. So technology is advancing very rapidly and it's always something to look at to go get a, a set of eyes on the same type of evidence to move these things forward. And, uh, and also we're hiring at Authram, and so we wanted to get these stories out there. There's a lot of good scientists that are up and coming and um, we, we'd love to get those people involved in the work we're doing. Well, that's wonderful. And I think whenever you do a project like that, there are surprises, things that come out of the process that you like the best. Mm -hmm. Any stories to share with us? Um, you know, I, th I thought it was just, uh, it was a lot of fun going back to some of these investigators. You know, it keeps coming back to them. And I think for me personally, um, you know, it starts with them. That's the first call I have. And then it's the last call. And, and usually that's a good call, right? It's, they've spent all this time, you know, uh, on their end dealing with investigating and talking with family and, Sometimes those conversations between them and, and family, um, it, it, can be, it can be frustrating and sad, right? And um, not a lot of positivity. And so when we have that final call and there's some sort of resolution, that, that leaves a good feeling with everyone. And then everyone gets back into their jobs and goes their separate ways. And so when we had the opportunity to do the missing piece, um, there were some folks I hadn't talked to other than maybe occasional text, how you doing, what's new, uh, to go back and revisit these things. and, and you know, I could tell some of the investigators, no matter what they were working on now, it's kind of like a breath of fresh air to go back and 
uh, something positive that they'd been working on and, and that had a really good resolution. I enjoy watching them. It's like a, a mini dateline. It's, it is. It's yeah. very interesting to see. Right. Well, let's talk about an author initiative that I'd like to learn more about, DNA Solves. Sure. Yeah, can you tell us what that is? Absolutely, so we started DNA Solves, gosh, I guess it was uh, spring 2020 maybe. Um, and, and we started it because we, we came across a lot of cases uh, from agencies that were in rural areas um, or agencies that just weren't well funded for advanced DNA testing. And some of the, these methods are so cutting edge that there's not a lot of money earmarked for this type of testing. And in, in discussing the evidence in these cases and talking to investigators, we came to the conclusion that the, literally the only thing for moving these things forward was funding. And uh, we, we're very fortunate to have a lot, of, uh, a lot of generous folks that follow the work we do. Um, they follow us on Facebook, on Twitter. We have a Facebook group called DNA Solves Advocates. People are welcome to join, uh, where we post about cases that we have permission to discuss about, that we're raising money for, that we solve. And in doing so, uh, evaluating those cases on the front end, we said, why don't we build a platform where we can raise money from the crowd, uh, we can go promote the cases, we can share on social media, we can basically have a, a, a one place that's very transparent with casework that we are working with law enforcement where people can come to help. And they can help in really three ways. They can donate a few dollars towards a case for testing. They can share that case on their social media platform, one click. We're a very tech savvy group, so we made it very easy. And three, if they want to upload their own DNA, we have dnasolves.com database that's only used for law enforcement cases, reuniting uh, unidentified human remains to family or helping to find perpetrators of crime. And so uh, folks can come, they can see what we're working on, and, and we built that platform to initially address those with, without funding, but ultimately it's kind of come uh, a place where we can tell stories of these cases, kind of a, a mini missing piece without the video, right? It's all in stories and, and it has uh, images of folks that we we're able to, to work with law enforcement to identify. And uh, it's just a great place for people to come and collaborate. And it keeps coming back to that. But I think ultimately you even have the public out there that can help cases these days, whether it's their DNA, a couple dollars, or just sharing. Very forward thinking. I mean, I really think that's the way things are headed. I mean, speaking of the stories, are there any you can share? Who's using it? Yeah, I, I have one, one of my favorite stories is actually out of uh, Williston, North Dakota. And it just happens to be where my grandparents are from, so small, small world. Uh, but we were working with an investigator there with the sheriff's office, I believe the agency was. He had a John Doe. I don't remember the year or many details because we never got to, to work on it, and here's why. Um, they were going to partner with us to, to do the case. We were going to announce it on DNA Solves. We did a write-up about the case. They did a write-up, uh, we shared details, and then they put out a press release on their end, and we put out a, a note on our DNA Solves Advocates group on Facebook, and people started sharing it. Uh, the detective called me a week later and said, Michael, uh, someone saw the story that you guys put out on Facebook, called me, and she said, I think you have my cousin that I haven't seen in 30 years, because there were some tattoo descriptions and things of that nature. And sure enough, she was able to come in, talk with detectives, and figure out that it was her cousin that she hadn't seen in 30 years. So just the, the collaboration of people chatting about something, the chatter in social media was able to solve a case before any money had to be raised or any testing had to be done. So it was a really cool story. That is amazing, that is amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I love stories like that, the power of just putting it out there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep. Well, I know you've worked on a lot of really interesting cases, and there was one with um, Stephanie Isaacson of Las Vegas. Can you talk about that? Yeah, Stephanie, uh, she was a 14-year-old girl. Um, she was, uh, I think, what year was this? I want to say 1989. Um, and she was staying with her dad. Uh, her, her parents were divorced. She was staying with her dad, and she was walking to school like she do did every day, five days a week. Uh, I think it was like a half-mile walk to school, and she crosses this little desert undeveloped lot and um, one day she did this and she never came home and um, uh, the dad I think found out later in the day that she didn't show up to school uh, immediately calls the police they go out looking they end up finding her body she had been sexually assaulted and murdered in that little field and um, all these years went by and they weren't able to figure out who did it um, this case is really cool because it's another collaboration we actually had a, a private donor, um, his name's Justin Wu, he's out of the Las Vegas area, 
And uh, he actually is a philanthropist. Um, he's an entrepreneur, but he started a philanthropy in Las Vegas just to help the local community in a variety of ways. Um, about six months ago, maybe eight months ago, he heard about the work we were doing and he met David, our CEO, and they were chatting and Justin said, hey, look, I'm from Vegas. Um, if you can find a case in Vegas, I'll help fund it. Like, I would love to see a cold case get solved there. And so we reached out to uh, the Las Vegas Metro PD, uh, talked to some great people there in their lab department, and said, hey, here's the deal. We have someone willing to fund it. Um, what, what cases do you have that you'd like us to take a look at? And this was a case that had failed repeatedly at, at various uh, other laboratories, other methods. Uh, so much so that they almost consumed the entire amount of evidence left that, you know, if you consume that, now you really got a cold case. And I think it was down to 120 picograms, 130 picograms, right in that range. And um, thankfully, we were able to sequence it, and we really didn't have too much of a problem with it, which I think is another story out of this case, is like, that's very tractable evidence sometimes. And a lot of people, when they see quantities that low, they immediately go, there's nothing I can do, or they've been told there's nothing they can do. So it's always good to reevaluate it. But we built a great DNA profile. Uh, we started doing some records research and family tree building. And uh, we were able to figure out who did it. And um, that was one of those cases, too, where working with the investigators, she, you know, she talked to the family, I think, once a month on what they were doing what the, for how long ago was that, 30 years, something like that. And so um, to be able to get, give that call and have that conversation and then seeing them being able to confirm it on their end. And it actually linked him, he had another sexual assault homicide that was three years earlier, where I think they weren't able to prosecute him, but it linked those two crime scenes together. So um, yeah, that was a, it's a, a great uh, demonstration again of a collaboration in terms of funding, lab work, investigative work, and then able to solve two cases and, and kind of clear tooth there. And now we're hoping to do a lot more work with those folks out there. Well, that is remarkable. We're hearing so much more about, you know, very small amounts of evidence or touch DNA and how much more people are able to do with that. Did forensic genetic genealogy play a role in that case? It sure did, yeah. Yeah, it was one of those where we had to build a profile that was going to be applicable and, and suitable for the databases to upload and, and build family trees and do genealogy. Um, the, the, the difficult part was really just, um, you know, getting the case, right? Because we, we had to find someone to fund it. And uh, luckily, Justin came along graciously and, and helped that out. Sounds like it opens up a lot of possibility for the future. It does. I, I think there's, a, you know, there's um, the possibility of a lot of cases that have low quantity DNA, low deg or high degradation, high contamination. Um, I think all those should be re-looked at. And then I think the, the opportunity on the funding side, too. I think the more that uh, we're able to get through these cases, however they're funded, it's gonna demonstrate that uh, this type of advanced DNA testing should be part of the investigative model, right? They should always go through the traditional, get a profile, upload to CODIS. If it doesn't work, it can flip to this type of testing and we can have a lot of success in building those DNA profiles, digitizing evidence, which that in itself is a, is a win. And I like to celebrate that, just like you would burn a, uh, let's say a CD to MP3, you don't have to worry about the CD scratching anymore or getting worse off. Your evidence is now in this pristine fashion that you can always use in genealogy. If it doesn't solve in genealogy that day or that year, you have this profile you can always target tests up to third cousin to do kinship analysis. So there's all sorts you can do. Just digitize the evidence. Well, what's next? Any uh, new techniques, cases, anything you can share? I know that gets dicey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, there's not a ton of specifics I can share. Um, you know, we're, we're growing a ton. That, that's what we're really excited about. We're adding a lot of uh, really great people in the upcoming months um, and a lot of new positions. Um, we're working with a lot of new agencies that are very excited about the work that we're doing. And so I, I think it's going to open up to, uh, instead, of, and start, excuse me, instead of doing these one-off cases, I think we're going to start getting a lot more of chunks of cases, right? People are going to figure out basically on the parameters of what's the least you can do Let's go look at everything that's the least you can do and everything that's above that, and let's get after it and see if we can get these figured out. I think that's what's going to end up happening. Well, I can't wait to hear and see and whatever the next Missing Piece episode might be. Yes, yeah. it's fun. I think there's a new one going to be coming out soon, okay. so stay tuned. Oh, good. Very yeah, good. A little tease. <laughs> um, well, and I know Hawthorne is fairly new, but how did you get involved in this work initially? Like, what drew you to this field? Sure. So, um, I, as I mentioned, I was in the medical space a while back, and I did pharmacogenetics, which basically measures how quickly you metabolize uh, med, uh, medical drugs. 
And so I was working with a lot of pain management clinics and helping them figure out what the correct dosage was for their patients. And I, I met David in one of those ventures and uh, he and I hit it off and I, I right away knew I was here's someone I could work with really well, but he's also just very bright um, and, and he jokes about it too. And I think I mentioned it to you before, he's a one trick pony. DNA is like his one trick, but he knows it extremely well. You know, I'd say better than anyone in terms of this type of testing and how to access this type of evidence. And so when he called me and said that they were working on building this and would I like to be involved, there was no hesitation from my end. You know, I, I enjoyed the work I did in the past, but this is, um, as we were talking, it's, it's impactful. Um, it's still a job. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, but, it, but in the end, you're trying to make a positive uh, outcome for folks, be it families, investigators, um, and just the, the world in general. So it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun, and, and I'm looking forward to the future. Well, and we're looking forward to hearing more about it. I know at Ishii, we're always interested in what's, what's next and what everyone's working on. Um, so do you come to Ishii often? I will be. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so How do you is, find it? Yeah. I, I was on the uh, virtual one last year, of course, because of the pandemic. Um, so this is my first in-person. and I'll, Oh, yes. Okay. So thanks for having me. Welcome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'll be at all of them going forward for sure. Okay. That sounds great. Well, we'll love to hear about your experience. Absolutely. Yeah, happy I'm to share it. Happy that we get to be in-person and remote and bring everybody together in any way we can until Absolutely. we're back to a little more normal. That's right. Yeah. We'll do the best we can. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Michael. We yeah. really appreciate it. You bet. My pleasure.